Prime numbers are very simple things. They're just numbers that will only divide by themselves and one without leaving a remainder. But there's a lot we don't know about them. In fact, prime numbers are the subject of some of the greatest unsolved problems in mathematics. One of the most famous unsolved problems to do with prime numbers is the Goldbach conjecture, named after the German mathematician Christian Goldbach. This states that every even number greater than 2 can be written as the sum of two primes. You can easily show that small even numbers are the sum of two primes, for instance 4 is 2 plus 2, 6 is 3 plus 3, 8 is 3 plus 5, 10 is 3 plus 7, and so on. Much larger numbers have been checked using computers, and the rule has never been found to fail. But no one knows if it's true in all cases. Another unsolved conjecture has to do with pairs of prime numbers that differ by just two, such as 3 and 5, and 11 and 13. These are called twin primes, and the so-called twin prime conjecture is that there are infinitely many of them. To date, though, no one has been able to show that this is true beyond doubt. Perhaps the greatest mystery to do with primes concerns their distribution. Among small natural numbers, primes are very common, but they get sparser and sparser as the size of the numbers grows. Mathematicians are interested in the rate at which the thinning out happens, and how much we can know about the frequency of prime numbers. They don't occur according to any strict regular pattern, but that isn't to say they just spring up any old way. In the Book of Prime Number Records, Paolo Ribbenboim says this, It's possible to predict with rather good accuracy the number of primes smaller than n, especially when n is large. On the other hand, the distribution of primes in short intervals shows a kind of built-in randomness. This combination of randomness and predictability yields at the same time an orderly arrangement and an element of surprise in the distribution of primes. Countless mathematicians have commented on the enigmatic nature of prime numbers. They're the simplest of things to describe, so simple that children in elementary school are taught what they are and are often asked to name the first few of them or say whether a number is prime or not. They're also much like the atoms of the numerical universe from which all other natural numbers are built. You'd think there'd be every reason to suppose that they obeyed strict laws and that it should be easy to predict where the next one occurred along the number line. Yet these most elemental of mathematical building blocks are shockingly unruly and capricious in their behaviour. It's this tension between expectation and reality and the strong suspicion that some organising principles lie just beyond our grasp, which has fascinated mathematicians for centuries. Looked at individually or in small groups, the primes do seem to be lawless, but viewed en masse like shoals of fish, a previously hidden level of organisation emerges. One of the strangest discoveries about them happened by accident. While sat listening to a dull lecture in 1963, the Polish mathematician Stanislaw Ulam started doodling on a sheet of paper. He wrote down a square spiral of numbers starting with one in the centre and gradually worked his way out along a rectangular grid. Then he circled all the primes and noticed something surprising. Along certain diagonals of the spiral, as well as some horizontal and vertical alignments, prime numbers were unusually dense. Larger Ulam spirals, produced using computers and containing tens of thousands of numbers, continue to show these patterns. In fact, it seems they stretch out as far as we care to calculate. Some of the prominent lines in the spiral correspond with formulae that are known to generate a lot of prime numbers. The best known of these was discovered by Leonard Euler and is named after him. Euler's prime generating polynomial, n squared minus n plus 41, spits out primes for every single value of n from 0 up to 39. For instance, for n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, it outputs 41, 43, 47, 53, and 61, respectively. For n equals 40, it gives the non-prime square number 41 squared, but continues to yield a high frequency of primes as n gets larger. There are other similar formulae that, for some reason, have this ability to spawn primes at a great rate. 
Mathematicians continue to discuss the significance of the patterns in the Ulam spiral and their connection with unsolved problems such as Goldbach's conjecture, the twin primes conjecture, and the hypothesis known as Legendre's conjecture that there's always at least one prime between consecutive perfect squares. What the spiral makes very clear is that there are patterns and that despite appearing haphazard in their distribution, primes follow some overarching rules that govern their behavior in large groups. The best theorem we have about how the prime numbers are distributed is called, not surprisingly, the prime number theorem and is widely regarded as one of the greatest achievements in number theory. In a nutshell, it says that for any number n that's large enough, the number of primes less than n is roughly equal to n divided by the natural logarithm of n. The natural log of a number is just the power to which the number e, which is equal to 2.718 and so on, has to be raised to equal the number. This formula doesn't tell us where the next prime lies, but it does give a pretty accurate indication of how many primes there are within a given number interval, providing the interval is large enough. The prime number theorem took a century of effort to prove. It was first suggested by the German Carl Gauss when he was a teenager in 1792 or 93, and independently by the Frenchman Adrien Marie Legendre a few years later. Of course, mathematicians had long recognized that the gaps between primes tend to get wider as the size of numbers increased, but it was the publication of extended tables of primes and of longer, more accurate tables of logarithms in the second half of the 18th century, which helped spur efforts to find specific formulae to describe this thinning out. Gauss and Legendre spotted that a one over log type of function was at work. Further progress toward refining the distribution formula was made by the Russian mathematician Pafnuty Chebyshev between 1848 and 1850, but the biggest breakthrough of all came through the efforts of the German Bernard Riemann, who in 1859 published a short memoir, his only writing on the subject, titled On the Number of Primes Less Than a Given Magnitude. In it, he put forward a suggestion, subsequently called the Riemann Hypothesis, which has tormented mathematicians ever since in the attempt to prove it. The German mathematician David Hilbert reputedly said that the first thing he'd ask after waking from a sleep lasting a thousand years would be, is the Riemann hypothesis established yet? In his book on the theory behind Riemann's suggestion, the American mathematician H.M. Edwards wrote, It is now unquestionably the most celebrated problem in mathematics and it continues to attract the attention of the best mathematicians, not only because it has gone unsolved for so long, but also because it appears tantalizingly vulnerable, and because its solution would probably bring to light new techniques of far-reaching importance. I'll be talking about the Riemann hypothesis in a future video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.